Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Metropole TV. This is The Smart Investor. I'm your host for the next hour. My name is Ali Khan Satchu, and it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Let's start with some Kenya news. Uh, this caught my attention. Chart of the week from the World Bank, and it's talking about electricity access. And look at that, 82 out of 100 Kenyans have access to electricity. And that's a significant story. Of course, uh, there were some stories about how people weren't using that much. But I mean, you know, that's a significant success. And I, I think the government deserves uh, a great deal of praise for that. But you can see, look at Somalia 3, uh, Yemen 19, Nigeria 22, uh, Madagascar 27, Mozambique 38, and the point is, without electricity you can't industrialize, and that's a fact of life. Um, let me turn to Kenya Airways. The board of Kenya Airways has accepted the resignation for personal reasons of KQ CEO and Group Managing Director Sebastian Mikosh. Um, let me show you the financials, uh, KQ financials, over the last few years. Um, I think I'm stuck here momentarily. Uh, KQ, uh, basically, uh, what you can see is that the revenue line has stayed pretty static, um, but, uh, you know, the profitability has been the problem. Revenue above 100 billion for a few years, but essentially, if you look at the profitability, that's been the problem. And hence, the share price has tumbled 59.21% this year, the biggest faller at the Nairobi Securities Exchange in 2019. The Nairobi All Shares up 4.29%, the NSC 20s down 6.6%, and the All Shares trading at a price earnings ratio of 11.25. That means for each shilling that the stock exchange earns, you're paying 11.25 uh, as a multiple on that. Now let's turn to the tea auction. Very interesting, a uh, lot of tea was withdrawn. Two million kilograms, the price fell from 220 to 212, and two million kilograms of tea were withdrawn by sellers, um, not prepared to sell at that price. That's an interesting market signal. It's telling you that folks are not happy at that sort of price and are reducing supply. So that probably represents a baseline for prices for the rest of the year unless we get some different action. Um, as I was coming into uh, the studio, um, it was announced that President uh, Mutharika, the incumbent, uh, had won the election. The election was being called the Tipex election. I don't know if you remember Tipex. Tipex was that white uh, wipeout uh, uh, material that you could use if you wanted to uh, clean up a mistake, and that's what they've nicknamed this election, the Tipex election. Uh, the court was sit speaking about taking their time, about looking through the evidence, uh, saying the complaints must be resolved within a maximum eight days between polling and the announcement of results. But we've had a quick announcement as I was coming in to the studio just now, Malawi, um, south of us. Uh, fourth poorest uh, country actually in the world. Let's turn to Ethiopia. A report came out today saying there are three million displaced Ethiopians, more than those displaced in Syria, Yemen, Somalia, and Afghanistan combined. That's a huge number. The upsurge in communal violence has coincided with the early days of Abiy Ahmed's tenure as Prime Minister and is arguably the greatest threat to his lofty ambitions. And that's a shocking number, isn't it? I mean, three million, more than all those other countries where you've got wars going on. Um, so this, I think, is the biggest risk to Prime Minister Abiy, um, who's really uh, set out his stall, changed momentum in the Horn of Africa, speaking, uh, the right language, but he's got to still deal with this, and it's not going to be easy. There's a concern that the country is on a negative trajectory due to entrenched elite disagreement 
over what sort of federation Ethiopia should be and how to share power. That's the International Crisis Group. Unless there's some sort of agreement on a common vision for Ethiopia, there's a danger that the turmoil continues and possibly gets much worse. So keep an eye on that. Uh, on the ground, it's, 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 it's not uh, as, as it's being described and spoken about by the Prime Minister. Sudan's de facto leader, that's him on the left, uh, was in Egypt uh, over the weekend. He then went to Abu Dhabi, and I saw this afternoon he's visiting Salva Kiir in South Sudan. The Gulf countries, of course, um, have, have uh, a stake in the outcome. They've been putting, throwing money at the problem. They're given, they promised about $3 billion to the uh, Sudanese um, and obviously are trying to control the outcome. But we still don't know what that outcome will be. We, ha we don't know what arrangement the military council has come to with the protesters who are demanding civilian uh, government. And uh, uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that development. Turning to uh, this, this is about the DR Congo, a report by the Century Group, Enough Project. This is uh, um, a report that's called Covert Capital, the Kabila Family Secret Investment Bank. Listen to this. It would have been hard to understand the significance of Kwanzaa Capital just by looking at the company's headquarters in a commercial garage in Kinshasa's business district. No sign marked its presence. In Congo, this is interesting, only 6% of the population have access to banking services. Equity Bank going after that market and doing extremely well last year. Triple digit revenue gain year on year. But going back to Kwanzaa Capital, which is the subject of this report, um, it talks about how they wanted to buy out BCDC uh, Bank, which was majority owned by the Belgian family called Forest. Um, they had a large stake in the bank for over a decade, owned roughly 67% of its shares. The patriarch of the family, George Forrest, estimated to be worth $800 million. And uh, the Kabila family, through Kwanzaa Capital, um, operating through an intermediary, made Mr. Forrest an offer of $50 million in 2013 for his shares. Forrest reportedly declined because he found the offer insufficient and significantly could not verify that the source of the funds was legitimate. So that tells you about increased uh, compliance, increased due diligence, even getting as far as the Congo. Uh, President Ramaphosa, of course, was um, uh, sworn, uh, sworn in uh, over the weekend. He made a tremendous speech. Uh, uh, in his speech, he said uh, he wants to build the Africa that all Africans want, to forge a free trade area that stretches from Cape Town to Cairo, bringing growth and opportunity to all African countries. Um, the brighter days rising upon Africa, already I seem to see her chains dissolved, her desert plains red with harvest, her Abyssinia and her Zululand, the seats of science and religion, reflecting the glory of the rising sun from the spires of their churches and universities. Um, it was almost as if this address was intended to be his final campaign speech. His words were stirring, this is the Daily Maverick, but for any specifics of the how or the what, um, we'll have to wait. S&P keeps South Africa in junk status. Um, Fitch also rates South Africa as junk. It's only Moody's who have them one notch above junk. But S&P is saying they're expecting some reforms and really... Uh, President Ramaphosa has got to grab the bull. He loves collecting bulls, I think, bull by the horns here, and really try and make a big impact now that he's got a mandate. Last week, I was telling you about what I was calling the China uh, emerging market and frontier uh, loop. And I was saying for 20 years, it's been really positive. 
we're now encountering a trend change as it turns negative. And one of the things to keep an eye on is the RAND. This is, you know, the seventh most traded currency in the world. It's an open market. And we could see a sharp move if that phenomenon turns seriously negative. Let me now turn to Barrick Gold and uh, Acacia Mining. Um, basically, uh, uh, Barrick Gold have made what is considered a very low ball uh, proposal for um, Acacia Mining. Acacia Mining got that $190 billion tax bill from President Magafuli. <coughs> and, uh, Essentially, that was totally crazy, off the charts number. They've never even made uh, $10 billion, let alone $190. But basically, um, a Barrick, who have a stake in Acacia, have gone back and made an offer, which was at a discount to the share price. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and a lot of people think that was a, a real low-ball offer and needs to be revisited. It's a peculiar situation, said a shareholder of Acacia. I'd never seen anything like it. Um, we've been engaged with Acacia, certainly whilst I've been around. So people are very, very unhappy uh, with that. Let's turn to, uh, I think we've missed my crude oil price, but the crude oil price basically was down 6.5% uh, in the last four trading days, but has stabilized um, uh, today. Let's see if that can continue to sort of find a base at the moment. And iron ore is really the best performing uh, commodity. This iron ore is actually the, the big bulk commodity that we have. And it's up another 5% today. It's up 74%. Look at that. Since November. Other than Bitcoin, nothing else has been going up like that anywhere in the world. This was all about that. Do you remember that dam that burst in Brazil? They had to close that iron ore mine. That reduced supply. And that created this huge surge up in the price of iron ore. And it really is quite a surge, isn't it? Now, international markets. Um, we had the euro dollar. Um, 112, 111.95 area. Um, this was all about the election result in Europe. The centrist bloc lost ground, lost its majority to the Greens, that's the environ environmentalists, and lost ground to the Eurosceptics, um, that's the likes of Brexit. But not enough to shake the Euro, and people had had very um, extreme projections, and I think this uh, result was less extreme than people had thought, and that's why the euro was reasonably stable. Let's turn to US, uh, China. Um, this uh, trade war, in my opinion, is now going ballistic. For quite a while, the consensus view has been that the US and China would, after all the theatrics, reach some kind of deal. President Trump is highly tuned to the markets, and in fact, something of a 21st century artiste. He does positive trade war tweets during the US market hours designed to soothe, massage, and finesse US asset prices. Trump predicts fast trade deal with China. The market goes up 100 points. And he turns much more, he turns much more negative in Chinese trading hours. This is next level gaming of a very sophisticated nature. And there are few leaders, if any, that I can recall that have appreciated the purity of the market signal and played the game at this Yehudi level, a uh, Yehudi Menuhin level, uh, a virtuoso level. Trump's head spinning and high velocity tweets lulled the markets. Uh, it, it, to think that something was going to happen positively. And I think lulled Xi Jinping as well. And as Jörg Wutke pronounced, Xi got Trump wrong and the Chinese economy is ill-prepared for what comes next. Xi, in my opinion, misread the signals. The point being, in the trade war, Trump is no longer the decider. 
there's clearly a consensus baseline in the U.S. for a full-on toe-to-toe slugfest, as it were. In China, however, there is only one decider. That, that decider was pronounced as much last year when he was made president for life, and that decider is Xi Jinping. But that put Xi Jinping on a pedestal. And he is faced with the strongman conundrum. When you're on a pedestal, all your citizens can point at you. And you are the decider. You will take responsibility. And this is his challenge. His political brand will not permit a retreat or a surrender. And the same thing with Trump. So Frederick Wu, a professor at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, sums up the feelings of many when he describes the U.S. demands as a list of surrender demands for China to acquiesce to, and saying the Chinese people can endure more pain than the spoiled and hubristic Americans. So essentially, I think Xi Jinping is preparing to lead his country into an all-out trade conflict with the world's still leading economic and technological power, and just as the Chinese forces ultimately fought the U.S. to a stalemate in Korea by pitting uh, sheer troop numbers and a far greater tolerance for mass casualties against superior American firepower, Mr. Z thinks he can direct a successful society-wide struggle in this trade dispute. Notwithstanding all the hyperbole and the very partisan commentary, you know, each side is representing their side, they're not looking at the middle ground or analyzing it, you know, uh, objectively. These are the plain truths. The U.S. exported $120 billion of goods to China. China exports $540 billion of goods to America. Who needs whom more? That's the issue. It now looks very likely that Trump is going to slap a 25% tariff on all Chinese goods. And I think that's going to happen far sooner than many people expect. We've seen Huawei, which is a proxy for this breakup between the two. We've seen Google suspend business activity with Huawei. <clears throat> that requires transfer of software, hardware, technical info. Steve Bannon, who used to be the chief strategist at the White House, says driving Huawei out of the US and Europe is 10 times more important than a trade deal. So essentially, my baseline is this is going to go off the charts, <coughs> that this is the biggest tail risk in the markets. A tail risk is the additional risk of an asset moving more than three standard deviations from its current price above the risk of a normal distribution. Tail risks are really, really bad outcomes. Ben Bernanke said people buy gold when they're scared of tail risks. The markets across the world shivered in May. Some caught a fever, and some on the periphery have become as delirious as victims of cerebral malaria. And I think the markets are still pricing in a benign, but much less benign than a month ago, outcome. We need to consider what a non-benign or even maximum non-benign outcome looks like. The Chinese currency is minus 8.8% on a year-on-year -year basis and is a very visible proxy. And if all of this turns ballistic, as is my baseline scenario, then this is going to fly through seven like a hot knife through butter. And the Chinese will surely use the value of the currency as a way of pushing back against the Americans. And if they do that, they'll be pushing at an open door. It's clear to me that directionally, money wants to leave China. And I think the Bitcoin rally, Bitcoin up 140% this year, best performing asset price in the world, bar none, is in part because of Chinese money leaving China through Bitcoin. And that is, I think, Chinese flight capital. Therefore, my prediction is when this currency, this Chinese currency slides, it's going to slide real quick. And that, therefore, that, that uh, feedback loop phenomenon, China, emerging markets, frontier markets, which has been positive for more than 20 years, 
is going to turn seriously negative. And unfortunately, I think the periphery will come under serious pressure, like what we've seen already in places like Lusaka. Bitcoin, last time I checked, was at 8,720. This is the highest it's been since May last year. And a big winner of this whole thing has been Vietnam, where they had a 40% quarter one surge um, uh, in terms of exports from Vietnam into the US. Let me leave you with President Trump, who's been in Tokyo, and he has also been uh, meeting with some sumo wrestlers. But in between, he said, I think we'll make a deal with Iran. It has a chance to be a great people with the same people. We're not looking to make regime change. The Iranians definitely think they're looking to make regime change. As I told you before, Iran used to sell 2.5 million barrels of oil per day. That was about $100 million. So far in the entire month of May, I've counted only one ship taking 2 million barrels of oil. So you can see they got $50 million in the whole of the month of May, it seems to me, as opposed to nearly $3 billion that they were getting per month about a year, a year and a half ago. I look forward to speaking to my guest in the second half, that's George Bodo, who's going to speak to us about the MPC meeting, uh, what we've learned from that, and generally have a look at the economy. This was part one. This was the Smart Investor, Metropole TV, with your host, Alikan Satchu.